Awesome. All right, guys, welcome. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, I'm glad that you're here. If it's the 12th, 15th, or even 101st, I'm glad that you or guys are back. Uh, today, as you can tell, we are, quote unquote, on location. I'm not in the studio. I've got people here with me, and it's exciting because they've got real estate questions just like you. So I'm going to give you some time right now to make sure that you type in the box. Type in the box. If you're watching us direct on YouTube, I want you to go over to cashflowdiary.tv. That way you can participate in the chat. When you get there, it's going to assign you a guest underscore username. Change that to your actual name, and it'll make it easy for me to answer your question. Okay? And uh, just hang out. Ask a question. It's not going to hurt, but I promise you this. I am never politically correct, but I'm always direct so that you have the ability to go out there, take action, become a bigger, better, badder investor soon. That's my goal with you today. Now, for those of you who have never seen me, you're like, who is this J guy? Uh, let me give you a quick synopsis of the story. A few short years ago, uh, my wife and I, we are, well, I was a financial planner. That's what I did, paper assets mostly. And what happened was uh, my wife, when she is sick, she has a condition known as hyperemesis. What that simply means is uh, that she can't eat or drink. So um, that became a very stressful situation. She almost died a few times while pregnant and I was scared. I didn't know really what to do. So we, uh, I started selling our personal possessions on eBay because I thought that was going to be the way to at least make ends meet. But that was a lot of work, a lot of shipping. I know way too much about eBay. Uh, but it, it worked for a time. Then one day to blow off steam, I went to go play volleyball. I jumped very high, landed on the guy's head, and punctured my lung. I was born with asthma. I, I got pleurisy from puncturing my lung. I had a hole in my lung, and I could not walk and talk simultaneously without fainting. So that created a situation in which we had literally nothing coming in but disability, which is the same as having nothing coming in, everything going out. Uh, we started squatting in bank-owned property, uh, technically homeless, as some would say. That happened on February 13th, 2008, and, you know, that was my Valentine's gift that year. Anyway, the point is, is that uh, around that time, a friend said, hey, I got a solution for you. And I know we all got friends with solutions. Uh, but this one turned out to be true. He said, you should become a real estate investor. And I looked at him sideways because at that time, we had a credit score of 398. We couldn't put $75 together. And I'm like, you want me to provide housing? I don't have a place to stay. This is weird. But OK, <laughs> I've got nothing to lose kind of here. So let's figure this thing out. Four months after that, we got our first transaction done. It's a buy and hold transaction that we still have today over in San Bernardino, California. Uh, at the end of the first six months, we did approximately uh, another two dozen transactions. 2009, we did about 70 to 90 transactions. 2010, we just kept doing more and more and more. Uh, today, we have a little over 350 units across multiple states in the U.S., one commercial building, 18,000 square feet, negotiating on a second. Um, we are also building a resort internationally. I also have one cell phone tower. With all that being said, I welcome any question you've got. Uh, so for those of you who are already part of the Cashflow Diary community, you've already sent in your questions. We do have some deals to review, and I'm looking forward to talking to them. For those of you who don't know, I don't look at the deals live or ahead of time. I look at everything live. I look at the questions live. So I haven't prepared some pat answer. Uh, uh, all mistakes are left in. <laughs> there is no editing. This is just how it is done. And for those of you in the room, uh, I invite your questions too. There's two microphones. You may either have to turn them on or hit the mute button. Or, uh, to unmute yourself. Hey, how you doing? And I happen to, so for, some, for those of you out there at Cashflow Diary Land, we're over in Phoenix right now. And there's some of you who are normally watching in Phoenix that are actually here today. So it's kind of cool to meet you uh, in that same way. But for you guys here in the room, feel free to pick up a mic and ask any question. There's nothing that's off limits. I'll do my best to answer them, but uh, you got the same caveat. I'm never going to be politically correct. I'll be absolutely direct on exactly what I think you should do in order to get your transaction done. So let's look at what we've got today. So, uh, oh, that's right. We have a podcast. For those of you joining us for the first time, cashflowdiarypodcast.com. Every Monday, new episodes at 8. Uh, we've interviewed a number of successful 
um, and uh, entrepreneurs. We've been doing this for a little while now, and it's exciting. John Asaraf is actually there, for those of you who may know. Uh, and there are a number of, uh, you know, what's his name? Uh, Billy Blanks, Jr., Shark Tank. Uh, that episode is also live. There are a number of episodes. They come out all the time. And even, yes, Jermaine Griggs is and has been a guest on the Cashflow Diary podcast. So figure, go check that one out. That one, that one actually began to tweak my head, and that's kind of how I ended up here. <laughs> it's because I was talking to him. It's awesome. Um, and then congratulations. We have Mark, Nick, and Pat. You guys have increased your cash flow with Cashflow Diary. You've been able to purchase some of our buy and hold properties. Uh, congratulations on getting that done, making those decisions, and moving forward. I'm very excited for you guys. And uh, for those of you who want to find out more about what I mean when you say you can increase your cash flow with Cashflow Diary, go over to begininvestingnow.com. All right, let's see. John's got a question. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yes. Okay, I have a caveat here. Uh, one of my private coaching clients had a question that was so stinking good that I had to have it here because I knew you guys needed to know. So here was the situation. Uh, he had someone, first of all, speak Spanish. He is not a native spa- uh, Spanish speaking. Is John, John, are you here? Yes, awesome. <laughs> Okay, um, so she came up uh, with the price of 95000 John, you're going to need to grab the mic. Uh, you're going to be broadcast now. You didn't know it. Uh, she came up with the price of 95000 So this, is a, this was in Phoenix, yes? Yeah, so, so somewhere near here. Just turn it on. It'll go green. So it's a triplex in Phoenix. It was $95,000. The major issue was, other than language, was the why the person wanted too much money. And what was really, really cool here, so let's look at this. She um, doesn't use realtors. She had the property eight months. She bought it at auction. Wouldn't say how many others have bid on the property. She's considering holding and fixing it up. And this is where the deal begins, by the way. You're always looking for the problem, okay? Many people say to me, Jay, how come I can't find property? It's because you're looking for the wrong thing. You're looking for problems, not properties. So she was upset by all the questions because I teach a question-based system in order to get your deals answered. So here, here are the three questions really fast. With these three questions, I can pretty much sell just about any service, but since we're talking about real estate, here's how it goes. <clears throat> it's always going to start with first, have you ever considered? Have you ever considered? And I don't care what it is that you're offering, just start the question with that. Hey, have you ever considered getting involved in real estate investing? That is the question that you want to ask. And you want to ask it verbatim this way, changing the words will get you different answers. Whether they say yes or no is irrelevant. What is relevant is that you ask the next question. And it's two words. Most important two words I've got for you probably today is really why. Because once you begin to ask the really why, you'll know what it is that's going to motivate them to be willing to do business with you. And that's what we're going to be talking about here on number five and number six. Uh, And then after that, the next question you're going to ask is, does it make any sense? And you're always going to ask a does it make any sense question. And you want to give them the power to say no. Because the one thing, believe it or not, human beings love to say yes, but they don't want to be, feel like they're forced into saying yes. So ask a question that says, does it make any sense? You know, have you ever considered getting involved in real estate? No, really? Why? Well, I don't like tenants. Oh, really? Okay, so if, I'm just curious. If you could be involved in real estate, do you think it makes any sense to be involved without having to worry about tenants? Oh, yeah, I'd do that. Ah, oh, really? Good. I have a way to help you. See, it's a very simple way to do that. And this is exactly what I've been teaching, John. And is Joanne here? <laughs> yes. I've never met you. This is cool. <laughs> uh, so, yes. Um, so this is the, what I've been teaching them for a number of months, and they've been going through the process. Here's the point. When you go through and I teach you to ask these questions, because after, John, after you ask really why, do you just go straight into the sales pitch? What do you do? Come on. Make me look good here. Well, after the really why, after they answer you talking to them really why, do you say, okay, cool, here's what I can do for you? Is that the correct response? No. No, good answer. <laughs> okay, we're going to ask more questions, and this is what he did uh, in terms of asking the questions. At the end of the day, here's the deal. How do you pay more than a property is worth and still make it a deal? That's what this came down to. 
Property's not worth 95. Has she moved off 95 yet? No, no, no. Yet. No, any updates since last week? I mean, I don't know, or Thursday when we talked? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. You're holding out hope. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so how do you pay more than a property is worth and still make it a deal? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Watch. Oh, wrong screen. Uh, one, two, boom. There it is. So here's what we're going to do. Remember that when it comes down to it, you've got two things. You can either get the price versus terms. This is not new information, but the question is, is what terms? Because what if I was willing to pay $1 million? Now, John, you go to her with a $1 million offer. What is she here? She nope. hears $1 million. And That's she's all excited. she heard. She heard $1 million. She also heard, I'm going on vacation. I can buy a car. And I heard a whole bunch of other things. That's what she heard. Okay, cool. Well, and she goes, yeah, that sounds great. Well, here's how it works. I'm going to pay you $1 a month. Uh, yeah, $1 per month for a million months. <laughs> right? Now, you laugh, but here's the point. Could you do that? Could you pay a dollar a month for a million months? Even if you were not here, are you planning on living a million months? I mean, you might plan on it, but some other people, some other things have a say in that, right? So here's what's important. The terms. Don't get stuck on that price. She's stuck on the price. So do you remember what we came up with? Because I, I really don't remember what we came up with as the term to offer her at all. Yes. Uh, what was we it? would go ahead and offer to pay her the 95 Yeah. over a course of however many months, I think 300. Oh, that's right. I said it was 95,000. She wanted 35,000 down. Yes. And I said, we'll pay you, no problem, 95,000, 35,000 down, and I'll pay you, was it 500 a month until paid? Or 250. 250 a month, a month until, paid, until paid. Which was 247 months. Got it. So guys, I want that you to pay. That was one option. The other option was to stretch it all the way out. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Newt, does he, glad you're here. All right. So there were, the other thing you're always going to do is you're going to give your seller, your buyer, whomever, I don't care who they are, you're going to give them three options, okay? The first option is typically going to be all cash, and it's going to be absolutely low, and it's going to be absolutely insulting, period. And if it's not, and if you're not embarrassed, if you're not going, there's no way they're going to accept this, then it's too high, okay? So go lower. So it's going to be all cash. The next, the second, or the third one is going to be Actually, yeah, the third one is going to be kind of okay. <laughs> it's like they might choose it, but they are eh, probably not gonna, okay? But if they did, you don't care. This is the one that you want them to choose, the big money one, right? And you're going to put that one in the middle. So every LOI, so if you've ever gotten our wholesaling course, uh, in fact, there's a webinar. If you click the link just below the video, there's a webinar uh, that'll probably be starting in a few minutes after we're done here. Um, or if not, you can schedule for a future date uh, where I'm teaching how to put the uh, inside of our full uh, wholesaling course, we have what I call our quick offer kit that allows you to be able to put this together really, really quickly. So you have an all cash offer, you have the one that you really want them to take, and then you have the kind of okay. The one that you really want them to take is a mixture of the two. So that way, if you don't have the cash, at least you've made a cash offer. If you, and this one is going to be probably no cash and nothing but terms, and this one's going to be some cash and terms. So for example, in this offer, what we did is that option one, do you remember how much it was? The cash? Like 35. The, oh, it was an all cash offer for 35,000? I, I just don't remember. Okay, 30, so 33,250 or something like 30, that. Okay, so it was 33,250, and you say, how did you come up with that number? We didn't, she did. The, the number that she came up with uh, came because that was the number that she seemed to want because she said $95,000 with 35% uh, down. That's right? Yes, correct. Yeah, so that was, we just used her number. That, okay, cool. She's obviously stuck on that number for a reason, so let's use that number, and that's exactly what we chose to do. Then it became, okay, well, Jay, I don't, I don't want to just, I would love to pick it up for just that, but that's not what she wanted. She wanted more than just that. Sorry, I'm fixing this display 
power sleep thing because I forgot to do it because we're on location. You forget new things when you're, there we go, boom. So the second piece was to come up with a, the offer we know she wanted or we hope she would take. The third one was no money down. So we said zero down and 100% financing. And we said, oh, cool, we'll give you your $95,000. I don't even remember the terms we said, but it was, what was it, 250 a month for until paid? No, it, it, we just averaged it out, and I think it was 347 a month. 347, okay, so I said 347 a month until paid. Now, there's a reason I'm using the language until paid, by the way, and I'll go over that with you. So when you're doing your offers, how you say, the words you say or don't say make all the difference, okay? The next thing right here is going to be the one that you want her to take. Do you remember what this one was? It was a the 35% down. 35% down and with 250 a month until paid, right? Yes. Perfect. So 35% down gave her, gives her what she asked for immediately, which we loved, which she loves. That's what she was asking for. And now she hears, well, I can get $250 a month until paid. Now, knowing what I know and what you're about to find out when it comes to time value of money you can realize if you've ever heard of a concept called discounted cash flows or discounted valuations in any way, shapes, or forms, you know that you actually bought this property at a severe discount. Here's why. I'm going to put my iPad right here. Yay. That worked. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you this calculation of what I just said. So we had $95,000 minus 35%. So that 35% leaves a balance of $61,750. That's going to go in PV, also known as present value. Then we're, what we're going to do is I said it was $250 a month until paid. So it's $61,750 divided by $250 a month. That's 247 months. Okay, so that's $250 is the payment. 247 months. I said until paid. Until paid means once it's done paying, once I'm done paying the balance, the balance would be zero. So what is the interest rate? Zero. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> zero percent loan. That's what I just negotiated with the words, but let's hear. Let's analyze what she heard. She heard I can get the money I want today and $250 a month. That's what she heard, which is true. That's exactly what she asked for. And I'm going to give her exactly what she asked for. The only thing is, is that when I discount this cash flow, so all I got to do to discount this cash flow is I'm going to put in the inflation rate. Now, maybe you call me pessimistic, but I'm going to put in a nine, as in 9%, and say that what that really means is I kind of paid $28,000 for that $61,000 today. If I was to pay it all off today, that's what it would take. It would take a deposit of $28,000 earning 9%, i.e. the inflation rate, in my opinion, okay? Uh, that's what it would take in order to pay off that same $61,000 so that I didn't have to worry about making that payment, i.e. I bought it significantly less. What's that? So you bought it for half. I bought it for half. And all I did was use terms. I gave her everything she wanted, everything she wanted, and this works. And I had a property in Atlanta. I've since sold it on this, on this very same structure. It was very awesome because they were so focused I must have this amount of money per month. And I just strongly believe if you've got the motivated seller, there is a way to create the transaction. There's a way to create it. It's up to you to come up with those creative strategies to make that work. Jacob, any questions in the chat room? There's one. Sep. Hi, Sep. How you doing? Let's find out what you've got. And that didn't work. Hit refresh. <clears throat> mm. I don't know. I didn't break it. You broke it. I blame you. Don't we always, we always blame the help guy. Oh, I'm at cashflowdiary.com. I do that. Now that I do all the time. Cashflowdiary.tv chat. That's why I was like, how come I'm the only one there? That's not right. Uh, Jay, what do you think about multifamily properties that back to freeways? Okay. All right. So we're going to go a different direction now. Would I ever build soundproof walls, trees, or something else to alleviate noise? Okay, Sep, a good question. All right, here's what we're going to do. Uh, 
So here's how I'm going to answer that step. Remember, it's one, two, three again. One, two. We've got three different types of customers, right? And here's the answer to the question. The answer to the question is, whom do you want to serve? I don't know with just, just this information. Because here's the point. As you guys already know, I look at real estate, and there's three types of general customers out there, right? There's the Walmart customer. There's the Target customer. And then there's the Nordstrom customer, right? So they all have different preferences when it comes to their real estate, right? Down here, you better have a swimming pool. Up here, a swimming pool is only a hazard and it will cost you money. Uh, th th those are different things. Down here, if you don't have a, a garage with a door opener that works with your iPhone, you're in trouble. Up here, you hopefully have a garage door. I mean, two completely different things, and I know you guys understand this. Who do you want to serve? So, would I ever, that's the question, build soundproof walls? Would I ever do the extra things with trees. Now, the other things you guys know about me, I, I am not an environmentalist. I'm a tree chopper, not a tree hugger. It's just the way it is, okay? Um, because they destroy my roofs and my plumbing, and it costs money. So uh, multifamily properties back to freeways. If I'm working in Walmart, the answer is absolutely no, because that's the very shady corny, uh, corner that Ray Ray is looking to go into and hide so that he can jump in the window and make something happen. So if you look up Set Ted, let me show you guys one more time. Go over here, go to Septed, go to, actually, let's just go to Wikipedia, CPTED, and that's all I'm gonna type in is crime prevention through environmental design. Crime prevention through environmental design. You'll learn that you wanna eliminate those dark corners. You'll learn how to illuminate and cut trees and put the right types of shrubs just below the window to make sure that the shower uh, shower windows are at a certain height because when ladies are taking a shower, the window shouldn't be at a certain height, if you get my meaning. All of these things make a 100% difference on whether your property gets sold, i.e. rented. So if your customer is Walmart, in my opinion, backs against the freeway, don't like it. However, Nordstrom, you could work with that because that person is going, hey, it's next to the freeway. I could get on the freeway faster and go to where I need to go. Also, they would pay for what you asked for here. What you asked me for is, uh, where'd it go? Chat. You said uh, soundproof walls, trees, or something else to alleviate noise. In Nordstrom, I can say, you know what? You, you could have one of our standard apartments or one of the upgraded units that's been noise-proofed for an additional monthly fee. I can do that in Nordstrom. Ain't no way Walmart's doing that. They're looking for everyday low prices, <laughs> okay? And that's just not going to happen. But in Nordstrom, I got a shot because I've got to spend extra money. If I'm going to spend that extra money, you darn sure better get extra revenue from it, okay? Don't just spend extra money because it makes you feel good. Make sure that your customer is willing to pay for it. If they're not willing to pay for it, then there's no need for you to do that, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions in the room before I go? Okay, just grab a mic. I don't know where they are. I have no clue. And uh, before we get over to the next deal, because I think we have another one there. <clears throat> uh, the mute is on the bottom of that one. You, you, let me see. Hello, hello. Yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah, thank go you. Yeah, no problem. For coming here. Um, you know, my husband and I have been really talking about building our investment portfolio. No problem. And we're really super green on the real estate end. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at um, wanting to get into the units, apartments, or duplexes, triplexes. But should is it better for me to go and get a real estate agent, or should I become the real estate agent so I know a little bit more on that on that aspect? Okay, so this is the agent or do-it-yourself question. Is that, is that what right. you're asking me? Right. Okay, got it. All right. So here, here's the thing that you've got to consider. And what was your first name? Monica. 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 Here's what you've got to look at. Uh, you've got four essential components. There's more than these, but there's typically four. It's knowledge, time, money, or credit. Knowledge, time, money, or credit. The greatest thing about real estate is that you can leverage. You only need one, and you can leverage the rest. You only need one, you can leverage the rest, okay? So you've got to, this is a choice you get to make. It's not like one is better than the other. It's all relevant to your, what I call your investor identity. And one of the pieces of your investor identity is what is known as time horizon, i.e. 
How soon do you want this to happen for you? So let me draw this out. Here's what that means. You could draw a proverbial dotted line straight down the middle. On one side, you've got knowledge and time. On the other, you have money and credit. Typically, the person or persons who have knowledge and time do not have money or credit. And the converse is also true. Typically, the person who has money or credit typically does not have the knowledge or the time. And even if they do have the knowledge or the time, they usually don't want to spend or invest that knowledge and that time doing that thing. They have other expertise elsewhere, and it's not the highest and best use of their time. You must first fundamentally decide who you want to be. For me, when I first got started with real estate, one of the strategies I had to do was wholesaling because I, I had no knowledge and a whole lot of time because I had no job, no place to stay, and a wife that needed to eat. <laughs> At the end of the day, that was the thing. But I didn't have a skill set that the marketplace would pay me money for. Okay, So I had no money, no credit. Uh, there was just no way. Here's the cool thing, though. You can learn to find money. With the correct knowledge, you can eliminate credit. Therefore, you must learn to invest your time into knowledge if you're going to play that game. Now, the opposite is also true. You say, well, Jay, I don't want to learn this. Okay, fine then you find someone to play with, and I say play because wealth is a team sport, and uh, Jim Bunch is the guy who introduced me to that idea, just that phrase, and I love it, because it's true. Uh, you can play with other people in this game. If you're the person with the money and credit, then you need to work with someone who has the expertise and the team, play, uh, the team in place to be able to leverage what they know and what they've put together to be able to still achieve the same result. Because here's the fundamental, fundamental reason I say this. There is a difference, pay attention, there is a difference between being an investor and owning an investment. The investor is me. I'm invested in every deal. I'm out there. I've got teams on the ground. This is what we do. We eat. We breathe the market, no matter what marketplace we're in. That takes an immense amount of time between my CFO, my VP of operations, uh, the people who are flying out and looking at the properties. In fact, right now in the chat room, uh, some of our cash flow coaches are probably sitting right there, uh, Carlos and David. They're probably sitting right there to answer your questions. Here's the point. The point is that takes an immense amount of time. Because here's what's going to happen. You or your customer is going to ask us, hey, why did you choose this marketplace and why not this one? Why did you choose this property and why not this one? Why does this one make sense? And we must have very relevant information in order for that to make sense. And it takes time to aggregate, compile, and distribute that information in such a way that someone would be willing to purchase. If that's not you, then you leverage what you have, okay? And you hear me clearly. Use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. Okay? That's what it comes down to. And that's true for all of us. If you have the knowledge and the time, great. Then you use what you have to get what you need, access to the money and credit, so that you can both have what you want. Because many of the benefits of real estate can be, e uh, can be easily divisible amongst all the players. Just because you're not the one on the airplanes and beating the contractors up and, and talking to the mayors that like we do, that doesn't mean you don't get the same benefits. You're just exchanging something different for those same benefits. Does that make sense? So that, that would be the thing I'd have you focus on, is that, and it's a personal decision. Now, see, fortunately, quote unquote, for me, um, the decision was pre-made. <laughs> I didn't have the money or credit. I couldn't make that decision. It was pre-made. Now, here's the reality. The reality is, even if you're the person currently with the money or credit, you're going to eventually run out. And you're going to need to become, if you want your portfolio to continue to grow, you're going to need to become the other person with the knowledge and the time. Either way. It's just a matter of when do you want to do it. So if you said to me, Jay, can I build $10,000 a month of passive income? Yes, absolutely. you got to begin to tell me what you have so that I can figure out what you need so you can go have what you want. We can figure out how long that takes. That's part of what I do when either I'm coaching someone or in, in, on stage or all this other stuff is to help figure that out so that people go into the correct direction. Some people, they just want to use their money to go out there and create passive income immediately. And that's what I was talking about um, these three gentlemen earlier, um, Mark, Nick, and Pat. They, that's the decision they made. They said, you know what? 
All that we do is more than I want to do personally. So how about I just buy a property from you? Cool. That's what they did. That builds their passive income. They get to do what they want to do. Because some of my investors uh, and in our customers, they work in Hollywood. And I don't know about you, but I think the quality of movies is going the wrong direction. So therefore, I want them to take all their time and knowledge and please make something good so that I can watch it. <laughs> I'm going to take all my time and help your money grow. Don't worry about that. Please make a good movie because, you know, I, I want to have something to look forward to on Friday, you know, or Saturday because I'm always at the movies. And I, and I just want to make sure that, you know, I do my part. See, I feel like I'm contributing now, right? I'm contributing to your quality movie experience by making sure their passive income is taken care of. And it, it feels so good. Anyway, uh, any other questions in the chat room, Jack? Jake? Yes. All right. Thank you. Let's find out what they have to say. Ooh, ask. I live in Gary, Indiana. Okay. I, uh, hey, Amari. This is good. I live in Gary, Indiana. What strategies work in low-income neighborhoods? I know a little bit about that. It's mostly people who rent. Excellent. But the morale is low. Perfect. Or should I be looking in higher-end neighborhoods for rentals that barely cash flow? <laughs> I love that. You put it together already. You almost answered your own question. All right. So I'm going to go right back to this. You got the three types of customers. So let me ask you, you guys in the room, just answer out loud because I know he's answering too. So let me ask you, let's look at these three types of customers. Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom. Does, does Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom sell anything in common? Yes or yes? Yeah. They ha let's just say it's shirts. They all sell shirts. Now, I didn't just say go buy your shirts from Walmart, nor did I say go to Nordstrom and buy your shirts. Although Nordys and I have developed a really good relationship. That much I do know. Um, here's what I will say. When Walmart sells a shirt, do they make money? When Target sells a shirt, do they make money? When Nordstrom sells a shirt, do they make money? Yes. The answer is yes all the way around, Amari. It's not about the money. Please remove that from the equation. The question comes back to who do you want to serve and whom are you best equipped to serve? More importantly, who is your team best equipped to serve? Let me show you what I mean. All right. It is one, two, boom. The first decisions, and they need to go in this order. It's I, M, T, and D. You've got to decide individual, individually, got it. Woo Excellent. You've got to decide individually who do you want to serve. I could totally never shop at Walmart but own one all day long, and it wouldn't bother me as bit because that'd be a choice I'd made. I could totally own an Asian food restaurant knowing that I can't stand Asian food. That's me. But, if, but I have no problem with that. So long as I know how to serve the customer and you can do the same thing. So you must first to make that decision. Then you're going to look at the marketplace you're playing in. Not every marketplace is suited to a particular customer. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If I said to you, think about this, Amari, Seattle, Washington. When I say Seattle, Washington, do you think blue collar job? The answer is no. You typically are going to think probably tech or white collar in general. So if you knew that you wanted to serve someone who was blue collar, you probably don't think Seattle. Okay. So there are some marketplaces that just aren't conducive to that. If I said Silicon Valley, same thing. You're not looking for that lower end customer. You, you got a whole bunch of issues there too, but that's a whole nother story. But the marketplace also has to match. The next thing is your team. Here's the thing. When you're working in Walmart, you can't hire a Nordstrom contractor. When you're working in Walmart, if you hire a Nordstrom contractor, suddenly in the middle of MLK Boulevard, because Walmart is always, and Martha, Lu Martha Luther King uh, Boulevard is always you know, you know, where Walmart is. Here's the deal. You don't put granite there. That's not where you put travertine. You don't have the trace ceilings. That's, you just don't do it. That's not what you do. And if, you, if your contractor can only think and see and feel and knows how to serve that customer, you're going to spend too much money on your rehab. That's how it shows up when you're fixing and flipping. Inside of your buy and holds, your operating expense is too high and you don't cash flow like you were expecting. 
So Walmart cash flows, whereas Nordstrom tends to make money on the appreciation and the equity. Target's kind of a mix of both, and that's how you can play the game. So give you some quick examples. If you're saying Gary, Indiana is Walmart territory, well, there are strategies and team members that you're going to have to work with. For example, uh, we work in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. We also work in Danville, Illinois. Uh, We work... That's our Walmart territory. So um, that's tend to be where we work. But we know how to generate the cash flow in those areas because we have great relationships with people like code enforcement and property management and the political officials. And if we need to, uh, we do have a relationship with the police department and not just the department, but the precinct and not just the precinct, but the head of uh, the chief of police in that particular area. Because sometimes it takes all of that to create clean, safe, affordable housing. I don't care which customer you're serving, your job is to create clean, safe, affordable housing. And you're gonna do that with your team if your team is best equipped to serve that person. So having grown up in Walmart neighborhoods, it, that's why I started and it make the most sense for me to serve the Walmart customer. I understand them. Now that doesn't mean that you have to stay there. Where you start isn't necessarily where you stay. So keep that in mind. You know, you heard me say at the opening that we're working on a resort uh, internationally. I promise you, that's not Walmart territory, right? The point is, where you start isn't where you stay, but get started. And once you're started, stay started. That's probably the most important thing I can say to you right now. All right, if you're watching us on YouTube, please go over to cashflowdiary.tv so that you can participate in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I can't see you and or any questions that you might have or that you might be asking. So hopefully that'll work. Let me see. Time check. Good. <laughs> it's never enough time with you guys. Never enough time. All right. So let's look at this next deal that we've got here. Uh, that was a question. Did you have a question? What was the what? You just... Oh, I totally forgot. I'm sorry, my bad. She said, what was the D? And I bet you people online were like, what's the D? <laughs> and they couldn't say anything. See, they're, they're thanking you right now. The D, oh, that shrunk. Uh, boom. The D is uh, for the deal. And I'm glad you asked that because here's the thing. Most people come to me and say, Jay, is this a good deal? Is this a good deal? Is this a good deal? I can't stand the question because it tells me you didn't do the first three steps. Period. You didn't do them. Now, I can help you through the first three steps, but it tells me you didn't do them, and you're looking for me to tell you what to do, which I don't enjoy. Because most of the time, when you bring me the deal, I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work. And then you're going to be like, ah, but my whole life, yeah, I understand. You can get over it, put you back together, and I'll show you how to find a deal that does work. But here's the point. The deal is the most interchangeable part. It's the least relevant part. You've got to get, your, you've got to get the eye down. Like I said, you heard me say it. We provide clean, safe, affordable housing to people that need it when it matters most, period. That's what we do. We happen to use these marketplaces to do that in, and here are the people who are on the team. It doesn't matter what address the property is. This is what we're doing. And when you get your business model down to that that refined type of a statement, it's very clear, not only to you, and your team, but to your investors who are writing you the checks, what it is that their money is going to do. Their money is going to provide clean, safe, affordable housing to people that need it when it matters most. Here are the marketplaces that we do it in. And this is the team. The address doesn't matter because if you give, because here's the thing. I just happen to believe that there's no such thing as a bad property. There's no such thing as a problem property. There's a ton of problem owners, but not problem property. And that's what it comes down to, is that when you have these first three correct, the deal, we can just switch those out all day long when you've got the system in place. The rest of it is kind of irrelevant. So thank you for stopping me so that I could go back and catch that. Uh, Now, where did the keynote go? Ah, there it is. Okay, Jackson. Good stuff, Jackson. Give him a round of applause, everybody, because he just started our wholesaling program, and he's already got a deal. I love it. Sending it in. Um, see, Jackson, single-family house. Single-family house for 193000 5, 3, 15, 78. Income is 2750 Debt service on a 30-year fixed with 27% down, 685 Okay. 
I'm looking for a pass on positive cash flow using the checks and balances formula. No problem. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're just going to do the formula real fast. I'll leave that up there and use this side. Because, well, first of all, Jackson, let me tell you, I don't know who the target market is, but you're already playing, I'm guessing, in target, but you've got a problem. You've got two small bedrooms. You've got to have two small bedrooms already, or something's not built to code, because you've got 1,578 square feet for five bedrooms. That just says to me it's too small. And no spouse, no wife I know is going to be happy with a small bedroom. So just know that. I haven't walked the property. I haven't said anything. I'm just thinking about your customer again. Okay, The price point, I'm guessing, is in the target range uh, because of where it looks at. And a small bedroom is a no-go. This would be the upgrade house. This is not the first person. This is not your... Ooh, our first time house. The price point could be in the first time house category, but if they're advertising it as a five bedroom, you've got one of two issues already. It's either really, really tiny bedrooms that are built to code, or you've got really, really tiny bedrooms that aren't built to code, and you've got something else added on, because I'm looking at this right here as that something else. I'm not really sure what that is, but I would find out. So let's keep going. Uh, Let's run the checks and balances. Where's my marker? Here it is. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do, everybody, I'm going to take the purchase price. Purchase price times 1.5%, which is the same as saying I'm calculating an 18% hurdle rate. That's what I'm doing. So meaning I want whatever I pay for the property. Where's my calculator? Here it is. Uh, Whatever I pay for the property, I want that number per month. So if it's 193,000, so we've got 193,000 times 1.5%, and that's going to give us a number. So this is going to be the first pass or fail, 193 times 1.5% equals 28.95. I'm guessing this is a big old fat fail, uh, meaning the building needs to generate $2,895 per month in income. That's $27.50. Now, Under normal circumstances, I'd say move on. But I'm going to tell you, Jackson, to dig further. Because I'm guessing, and I don't know, now you're going to have to play the value add play. you got to ask your customer, hey, what else would they pay for? Could you add a laundry service? Could you add dry cleaning pickup? Could you add, uh, uh, ooh, ooh, yes, and it's got trees. Here's the play right here. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to advertise this house as specifically pet friendly. You are looking for the pet owner uh, that, yes, the pet owner, you're gonna advertise the outside, the trees, the extra space, and you're gonna charge Fido an additional $50 a month to stay there. That's what you're going to do. And therefore you have a shot at being able to get this $2,750 over to $2,895. And you're gonna have to sit down and think about your marketplace. Interview target investors. Ask them, have you ever considered getting involved in real estate investing? When they say yes, find out really why. And when they answer that question, you're going to ask them, tell me about the last five deals you did and why you did them. When you do that, they're going to give you all the information you need to know to figure out what additional services you can add to this property to be able to make it cash flow the way that you're looking for. So that's check number one. The second thing is, I don't like 27% down. I think you're, if, you, if you're trying to finance this traditionally, I think that's the wrong route already because you're putting too much money down. You know me. I don't like that unless you're playing the money and credit game and that's just your goal. You just want to put money down and go forward. I just don't like that. Um, however, you do need to solve that entry point problem. Although $685 a month, that could work out quite well for you, especially if you can get the rent to $28.95. So I normally don't say this, but I'm going to say go ahead, go for it. But you've got to get that additional income. You've got to get that number to $28.95 in order to make sure you pass so that when you pass it on to someone else as a wholesale deal that they cash flow. All right, Jackson, now you did a condo. Boy, you must have been actually watching the videos. Look at that. Look at that. I love you. You, Good stuff, man. Let's see. Condo, 100,000 to one. No, stop. Don't need to go any further. I'm not even going to do the math. It's a 2-1 condo, period. I can't stand 2-1s. It's a personal bias. They're hard to rent. I don't like the 
the customer that typically rents them because it's either going to be two single people so, and they're going to eventually have an argument and then someone's going to leave because they can't make the rent or they're going to get married and then they get married and guess what they're looking for? A house. <laughs> it's like, dude, it's too transient for me. I don't want to have to renew a lease with a new person every year or every six months or every what you're doing. This is an absolute no. The second no is a $235 HOA fee. Are you kidding me, dude? You can't write. That's no good. No bueno, not for you. Move next. Okay. <laughs> Any questions here in the room? Yeah? No? Jacob? Okay. If you've got the mic, go for it. There we go. Um, hey. I just was curious. Maybe yeah. it's too early, but I want to know what the other checks and balance formulas are. Oh, got it. The other checks and balances formula. No problem. Sure. The first thing that we're always going to do, let me go back to that property then. That was, boom, this one. There we go. Perfect. So the first one that I'm going to run is this the purchase price. And now, okay, let me also clarify. When I say purchase price, I mean all-in cost. That's probably a more accurate statement, all-in cost. That means if my goal is to rehab the property, that in that number is my rehab cost. If my goal um, is to use private money or hard money or whatever my financing is going to be, my financing cost needs to be in there. Whatever it is, my all-in and total investment needs to be right here times one and a half percent, and it must generate that amount of income. And I say income because occasionally if you get creative, uh, for in some jurisdictions, like uh, SEP, your property, your, your apartment building against the freeway, if it has a solid wall with no windows, especially if that wall is facing the freeway, that's called advertising space, my friend. And that becomes additional income for you. So when I say total income, that's what I mean. You got to look at the extra plays. Adding a cell phone tower onto your property could be additional income. Laundry facilities. All these things can boost the income to get to this 1.5%, but you need to assess the probability, feasibility of making that happen. And if you can do that, then that's the point. So that's check number one. Check number two is this. Uh, I'm going to take... The simple version is that I'm going to take what he's got here as the debt service, 685 times 4, and I'll explain that in a second. And whatever that number is, 685 times 4, it's 2740. And so long, again, I'm looking at the income, so long as the rent or total income from that property is higher than that number, it's also a pass. It's going to pass or fail one of those two tests. This, so many properties in California uh, fail this test all day long. They just completely bomb because the, the debt service, th this test says you have too much loan to actually cash flow. That's what that test says. This is always, a, when you're dealing with Nordstrom property, uh, this, is, this test nearly always fails, nearly always, with one exception, the amount of your down payment. Well, if you want to put $400,000 down on a $600,000 house, yeah, it's now going to pass. But you have $400,000 down. In my opinion, that's not the highest and best use of that cash. You could probably get a better return. It's an underutilization of resources. So, again, it's a fail for me. But if you've got extra cash, then great. Then go for it. But that's the second test. So it's one of those two. And if it passes both, it's probably going to cash flow very well for you. That's the because that's what I'm looking for. I'm primarily looking for cash flow, so my tests are all related towards cash flow. Any other questions? We have any, Jacob? No, cool. All right. So, uh, okay. All right. Twelve minutes. Got it. So, some of you have also. I, I want to make sure that you remember these cool little things. Many of you have seen. Oh. You've heard me talk about to you the fact that, you know what, you're going to be the same today uh, as you will be tomorrow or five years from now, except for two things, the books you read and the people you meet. You can see that today I'm meeting some really cool and awesome people, and that's exciting. So I've got two books for you. Uh, first, I just started reading this. I'm barely 10 pages in, and my mind is literally on fire. Go get it, period. I have no other 
explanation other than go get it. It's 8020 Sales and Marketing, The Definitive Guide to Working Less and Making More by Perry Marshall. Go pick it up. You say, Jay, I don't have enough time in my day. Cool. Well, go pick it up. You'll find the time because this will begin to make that difference for you. Secondly, as many of you know, whew, we're out of pre-orders, meaning uh, we've shipped all that we've had so far. Uh, I've, I actually, these are like the last <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got eight left <laughs> at the moment, which is good. They're $24.99. I have a feeling they're going to be gone soon before I leave this room, which is exciting. But in here is the entire story. You ask, what is my business plan? It's in here. You ask, how do I break apart deals? It's in here. Many of you have heard of the profit analysis quadrant. You want to know how to make it work. It's in here. You say, hey, Jay, I can't generate a lead. It's in here. How can I generate leads with no money? Guess what? That's also in here. What happens when things fall apart? I got a problem with the property. That's the middle of the book where I made a whole bunch of mistakes and I told you all about them. Uh, so all of those things are in here. Here's the point, guys. Uh, just below this video, you should see a link for the book. Feel free to go purchase that. The ebook delivered immediately, $9.99. And the physical books we are about to uh, ship, we placed another order. We're waiting for more to come. It'll, it, we're almost there, guys. We're almost there with all the pre-orders, and it'll all be filled. It's just going to be a little bit longer. I'm excited about it. I've been hearing back from some very cool people. As you can see, uh, Josh and Lisa Lannon, the Rich Dad Advisors for the Social Capitalist. You also see Andy Tanner, uh, the one uh, for stock. Uh, you all, and hey, look, it's Jermaine Griggs uh, right there as well, which is cool. Uh, to have had access to lots of really, really great people, Robert and Russell Helms, or Robert, or sorry, Russell Gray and Robert Helms. Uh, the, the real estate guys, you should check out their podcast as well, as well as John Asaraf. Here's the point. Inside this book, remember, you always, in your business, give more in use value than you take in cash value. So ask yourself this question. What could finding one new lead today be worth? Is it worth $9.99? God, I hope so. What could getting one more transaction be worth? Is it worth the price of shipping for this book? Hey, I'll even sign it for you. But the question is, are you going to do it? Please don't buy the book if you're not going to use it. By that, I mean read it and do what it says. Uh, yeah, I believe you. <laughs> I really believe you. My point is, I want you to make sure you go out there and use it. Don't join any of our courses if you're not going to use the information. Jackson has been doing this for maybe two weeks now. I'm not really sure. Um, hope, if he's in the chat room, feel free to tell him, Jackson. I don't know. But it's maybe two weeks, and he's already finding deals. That's what the webinar that has the link at the bottom is all about, how to go out there and find deals. It's the strategy that I used when I had a credit score of 398 and couldn't put $75 together. I had to find a way to find property, and I had to find a way to sell that property so that I could eat. And you can't say to me, Jay, I can't do this, because if you can breathe, if you can walk, you can talk, if your wife or spouse isn't in the hospital about to die, you've got more than I started with. So make it happen. Uh, the other thing that I want to show you guys today is that right here, cashflowdiary.com forward slash property. While yes, we've had three different people uh, make the decision to increase their cash flow, I think we have, so you see the red ones. You can tell the site design is there. Give Jacob a round of applause. Yay, woohoo, go Jacob. Um, here's the cool thing. We got some new financing in place for you. And again, guys, you're the first ones that I've told this to. We've got new financing in place. What you see on the right as the, pen, or as the uh, minimum down payment, completely ignore that. Click the link, download the flyer, because you're going to be shocked. But we've managed to get down payments down as low as $10,000 to $12,000 and give you a double-digit return cash on cash, total return in excess of 20% on some of the properties. Feel free that you go there and pick one of them, the green one, so we still, oh, nope, that one just sold. Jacob, we need to update that one, okay? So don't pick 1023 Grove, it sold. 27 Bismarck, I know it's still available. 428 Outen is also available. And all you're going to do is click the uh, flyer just like I did there. And on 23, why not? Oh, those are on my file. Those are, those are on my computer. That's why you did that. You're so smart. Okay, so 428 Outen, that's why we have this one. The updated down payment on that one is $12,000 with a 28.76% return. Um, 
sitting there. Now remember, they're non-recourse loans, so retirement plans qualify. If you're watching from a foreign country, you qualify because we provide the financing so you don't need a credit score like in the U.S. Uh, any more questions, Jacob? Excellent. Any questions in the room? One, give him a mic and let's make it happen. Will do. Are you charging sales tax on your rents? Sales tax on my, no. Sales tax on my rents, no. Uh, so none of the states are requiring that. They're, they're starting to hear, and, and it's really? messing with cash flow. Oh, that's time. a problem. Yeah, no. Uh, we, uh, well, that note to self, don't do deals in Arizona. <laughs> Thanks for making that easy. Uh, no, that, I, I mean, it's a sales and use tax. I guess that that's where they're going under the use tax is what they're looking at. But no, there is no charge for sales tax. That would suck. It does. <laughs> um, again, you remind me of something, though. This is why, guys, okay, hear me clearly when I say this one more time. The reason most, here's what I find. The reason most people, when you're investing, the reason most people have heard the don't go outside of 20 miles outside of your house, the reason that that's happening is because you don't have the team. You're missing the T in that situation. See, by being able to leverage someone else's team, even in a foreign state or foreign country, i.e. you don't live there, you can still have access to the benefits of that state or country without physically residing there. And when you are willing to build that team and infrastructure, you have access, you don't have to, you're not bottlenecked. Because in San Bernardino, where my first rental was, um, they started charging, a, it was a mandatory inspection fee. I'm like, okay, cool. Mandatory inspection sounds fine. They're trying to protect people. Then they said, oh, and you can only use our inspector, and it's going to cost this much. And I'm like, and then they said, oh, yeah, by the way, it's going to be per door. Cool. I'm not doing business in San Bernardino. And that, that's the decision we made for those types of reasons. And because we have access to a team that allows us to escape <laughs> California in that sense, uh, we do. So California's a great place to live, horrible place to do business. Uh, and that's just how I see it, you know. And having access to the team allows all of that to happen. Any other questions? Here. Time check. One minute. Thank you. Uh, what's the other one in the uh, chat? Oh, you said there was one more in the chat room? Okay. Let's find out what it is. Yes, two weeks. Oh, it has been two weeks. That's good. Jackson, good job. And notice how he's still watching today because he's got to learn. Good stuff. Uh, extra advertising space. Easy phased equity. Yes, Sep, you got it. Okay, let me show you guys something real fast as I breathe. <laughs> I said, uh, we don't have time to go into the whole thing today. But this is the profit analysis quadrant. So step nine inside the book Step nine inside the book, you say, how do I get partners? How do I raise capital? Uh, with this, what I'm about to draw, uh, what's in the book, I've been able to raise well over $7.5 million in a very short period of time to go out there and do real estate deals. Here's the point. It breaks down into four quadrants. One, two, three, and four. Boom. And in this quadrant, you've got appreciation. This quadrant is depreciation. This quadrant is amortization, and this quadrant is the almighty cash flow, all right? Now, here's the thing. You can split these up in many different ways. What, we're, what Sep is talking about in the chat room is phased appreciation. There are five types. Most people don't know what I'm about to tell you right now. Here's the thing I'm excited for you by. Two, three, four, five. There are five types of appreciation. Most people know only about one of them. So you've got found, you've got forced, you've got phased, and then you've got passive, and you've got inflated. Now, passive and inflated are in red because you and I don't have control over them. Let me explain those two first. Inflated simply means Janet Yellen decided to print more money and therefore, more money's in the system chasing the same number of assets. It doesn't mean that the asset value increased. It means as measured in dollars, people are willing to have more money. Therefore, they'll spend more money on it. The second one is passive. It's all about emotion. Hey, there's flowers in the front now. I'll pay an extra 10 grand for that. 
okay. <laughs> and, but someone else will say, hey, there's flowers, but I don't like those flowers, so I'll only pay an extra three grand for that. It's totally emotional. You and I can't control them, so we don't base our deals on those at all. We ignore them. But passive is the one that the general populace typically focuses on. It's the one that's on CNN, constant negative news. Keep that in mind. So the other ones are found, forced, and phased. Found, you can create. And I don't need to tell you that if I bought a 72-unit building for $60,000, do you know that that building was worth more than $60,000. And I found that appreciation. It occurs on deal negotiation. So negotiation is a very, very important thing. And you saw me do that earlier. Then you've got forced appreciation. This is what you do. So it's coming up on summertime, right? Guess what we're about to see? Flip this house, flip that house. I can flip that and you can flip this. All that stuff is about to come. All of that is about forced appreciation. This is what you do to the property to make it worth more money. That's it. You just put it back together. Phased appreciation, my friends, is where you and I get to have fun. This is where you take a church and turn it into a school and turn it into an apartment building. This is where you change the use. This is where you take a blank wall and turn it into advertising space. And that phased appreciation tends to pay the absolute most when you're looking at it. One of the buildings right now, what we're looking at, many of you already know this, so we're looking at putting a daycare on site. Why? Because my tenant has kids, and going to work is always a challenge when you're trying to get home by that magic six o'clock, because if you've ever had kids in daycare, you know that at 6.01, they start charging like 15 seconds a minute, or $15 a minute. It's crazy. So solving that problem through phased appreciation helps the entire building. Sep, you got it. Good stuff. Jay, when looking at income property, how do you determine if the seller is telling you the truth on the numbers as far as income and expenses? Should I ask for their QuickBooks? Uh, guest 584, um, they're lying. They're always lying. Just assume they're lying, and therefore you'll be fine. And yes, you ask for their QuickBooks. You ask for their mother's QuickBooks if you think you need them. I don't really care. Ask for everything. Let me, I mean, oh, I was just in Sacramento and this question came up too. And they were like, well, Jay, what are some of the due diligence items? And what I did is I pulled up the due diligence. I'm trying to see if I can find the Excel sheet. That, ah, due diligence checklist, here it is, watch. So this is a live document, this is the real deal, this is what I use when we're doing due diligence. And I'm just going to read from, you know, when I ask for stuff, I ask for everything. So let me give you an example of what I mean by everything that you probably haven't thought about. So first of all, I want you to look at this document. I want you to see that it has sections, and under each section, as it changes a the color, there's more documents to ask for. Um, and that's what's really cool. But what's even better is that you, we ask for all of them. So here's the operational documents. This is just the operational document. So I'm asking for the operational budget and statements for the last two years and current year. What does that mean? Copies of all leases and for all current tenants, age receivables, current rent roll, including lease rate, deposit held, square footage, start date, termination date, tenant delinquency, copies of all correspondence related to the property for the past 12 months. If the property got a letter, even junk mail, I want to see it. Uh, leasing plan, marketing items, ad <laughs> you get in the point? Ask for everything, okay? At least ask. They may not have it, but ask. So that later, when you need to negotiate terms, you can say, hey, here's what I need. You knew that I needed this information, but however, since I was unable to get it, how about you and I sharing the liability of me not having this and me taking this unknown risk by you carrying a little financing? Here's what that might look like. All of that. I'm not trying to get, I just love seller financing, you know? <laughs> it's fun for me, all right? My point is, is you need this information to properly operate the building anyway. Ask for it up front, okay? Oh, let's see, is that it? Is that it for today? Okay, excellent, guys. I'm glad that you have been here, hopefully. Uh, if you haven't already, go and uh, go to cashflowdiarypodcast.com. Uh, cashflow Listen to us. If, if what you like today 
Uh, there's a whole a year's worth, hours upon hours more of information sitting right there for you of very similar stuff so that you have the ability to get your deals reviewed. It, uh, so that, and, and feel free. We'll be here again next Tuesday, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time, uh, to help you with that process. Some of you, you're like, you know what? I am ready to take action now, Jay. I would love, love, love to get a copy of your book. I hope that's what you're saying. Click the link below, uh, $9.99 for the ebook, $24.99 for the uh, book, physical book. But if you buy both together, I give you a $5 discount and I signed it for you and it'll come to you as soon as more pre-orders get here. Uh, with that being said, I'm excited. I'm glad that you're here. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Just once you start, stay started. And I look forward to talking to you all guys, all of you guys again soon. Until next time.